Um, all right. I think we're going to start now because it is 1.33 and all of our panelists have been wonderful and moderated and given us so much of their time. So our event today is Women in International Law. Um, and it, we have a wonderful panel with uh, Ms. Lucinda Lowe, Professor Marsha Wiss, an alum who was one of us a few years ago without a pandemic going on, Julia. Spagari. I am really sorry if I cannot say that right. It's just, yeah. It's, and we have our moderator, Professor Sarah Panicino from SICE Europe. First of all, welcome to the first event from the ILAW Society. We are trying to make, do events together with SICE Europe and DC this time. And we hope it's as interesting and fun for you as we can make it. Um, there's not a lot more to say. Do put in your questions in the chat and we will get them. We will answer some of them in the Q&A at the end. I'm now gonna let Professor Panicino start off our discussion with our three wonderful panelists. Thank you very much, Akwanksha, for the introduction. Before introducing the speakers, the distinguished speakers of this panel, I would like to uh, thank the International Law Society for involving me in this very first initiative. Uh, I speak on behalf of all women professors at Science Europe, but I know that I'm also speaking on behalf of men professors at Science Europe, and we are very, very glad to be part of, of this type of initiatives and of this type of events. So it's, it's a sincere thank you. Um, I'm also very excited because this is a unique uh, possibility for students, both in Washington and here in Bologna, to have the chance to exchange career advice and to ask questions to uh, distinguished practitioners in, in the field, in the legal field, especially in, in the realm of, of international law. I am not going to waste any time and I move immediately on to introducing the individual speakers. Uh, I'd like to start with Lucinda Lowe, who is, as you've seen in the flyer that has been uh, distributed, she's a partner at Steptoe and Johnson. And of course, she's a very distinguished uh, practitioner in, in international law at a global level, if I may say. Uh, I think that first and foremost, it should be mentioned that Lucinda uh, is not only a member of the board of directors of the Coalition for Integrity, which was formerly known as uh, Transparency International USA, but she's also a member of the Secretary of State's Advisory Committee on International Law. And if I must say, most impressively for me personally, she is the former president of the American Society of International Law and a former chair of the ABA section of international law. Currently, she, uh, her practice includes representing audit committees, boards of directors and companies in internal government and international financial institution audits. She carries out investigations, enforcement matters involving fraud, bribery, corruption, and other compliance issues. I am sure that Lucinda can offer you uh, very concrete and very valuable uh, career advice uh, on uh, the, in the field of international law for those of you that are looking forward to start working in this field. Uh, second speaker, the second participant to the panel is science professor, uh, Marcia Wiss. Marcia, not only she is uh, a professor at SAIS Washington, she also lectures at Georgetown and she's an expert in uh, project finance and investment and she, at SAIS specifically, uh, she teaches international investment law. Marcia's practice concentrates on international project finance and business transactions. She focuses on financial structuring of and political risks and international project in emerging markets. She has been in the private practice of law for the past 35 years. And despite recently retiring, 
uh, as an equity partner at the global law firm Hogan Lobos LLP, she continues her activity in, uh, in the legal field. Uh, Marsha has authored numerous publications and uh, she has lectured on finance, investment, commercial and economic policy issues, of course, political risk analysis, as we have already said, banking, foreign investment, public private corporation, cooperation, uh, international finance, with specific reference to project finance, trade policy issue, trade with developing countries. Um, again, I think this is a unique opportunity for students. I do understand that you might meet Marsha in the halls many times at size and you have the opportunities to speak with her, but I think that this is uh, a, a specific opportunity to ask her questions that uh, have to uh, do with uh, career and career advice specifically. Our last speaker in the panel is Julia Spaggiari. Julia holds, well, first of all, Julia is an alumna of SAIS, and she is an Italian alumna of SAIS, and for this reason, I am particularly happy to have her on the panel. She holds a JD Magna Cum Laude from Università Cattolica di Milano, which I'm going to translate just for you, is the Catholic University of Milan. Uh, she also holds, of course, an MA with honors from Johns Hopkins School of Advanced, uh, Advanced International Studies, which she obtained in 2017. She currently works at the International Finance Corporation uh, World Bank Group in DC as a legal consultant. Her focus, her expertise is on integrity related matters at IFC, and, and it spans economic sanctions, internal investigations, tax immunities, anti-money laundering, and anti-corruption. Her international experiences prior to joining IFC includes working in the multilateral sector in the United Nations in Vienna, Austria, and as well as working in a private sector at an Italian law firm in Shanghai and in a German law for a German law firm in Milan. Again, if I may say, speaking with Julia and collecting her, her career advice is very, very valuable for those of you that are interested in pursuing this career as she can uh, offer you the, the point of view of somebody that is maybe beginning a very successful career that I am sure uh, will be brighter, it will be bright in the future, and again, different phases of career that can be helpful for everybody in terms of advice. Uh, I thought that we could organize this conversation in one hour of rounds of questions that I collected from the board of the International Law Society, they prepare them in order to be able to ask you the questions that students really care about. So I would like to ask a question to each of you and then we're gonna have a round of answer and we're gonna do this for about 45 minutes, one hour. And then I would like to open the floor to questions from the virtual questions from the internet. And of course, if somebody, uh, maybe Akshanka wants to step in and suggest uh, specific questions that were prepared in advance and that uh, did not make it in my list for the three rounds. Uh, after that, uh, we're going to close the event and I know Akshanka anticipated that Professor Schnebaum is going to uh, close the event with a message for, for the students. So let me begin. If you don't mind, yes. If you don't mind, I am going to follow the order that, uh, of, for the speakers that I see on my screen, which means that I'm gonna go with Lucinda first and then move to Julia and then move to Marcia. This way it's completely random. There is no criteria whatsoever. And I think that this, if you have followed uh, the, the Italian recent developments with constitutional referendums and some, some crazy developments about not voting for representatives, but picking them out of a bucket blindly because that somehow guarantees more democracy than selecting our, our representatives, you may see why I'm so concerned about specifying the criteria of, my, uh, of the order that I choose to follow. But uh, let's start with the first question and I am gonna address Linda for, uh, Lucinda first. 
The first question students are interested in is the following. What interests you in international law and why did you decide to enter this field? And as a follow-up, how and which are the actual obstacles or the challenges that you have encountered uh, as you progressed further into your career? Of course, this is a women in experts in the legal field event, so there is a hint about the specificities of being a, a female practitioner in, in the legal field. So Lucinda, if you, if you want to answer the question, thank you. Thank you, uh, Professor Benicino, and it's a pleasure to be here uh, with some old friends and, and, and to support uh, this site effort. So uh, I'd also note that not only are, are, are you choosing us in, in random order, perhaps, but you're also choosing us in alphabetical order. So you have two defenses, if anyone argues preference. So what interested me in international law and why did I decide to enter the field? Uh, I'll, I want to come back later to, to talk a little bit more about what is international law practice, because that term encompasses a lot, actually. But, but uh, what interested me in doing international work is really the first part of the answer uh, to your question. I had the opportunity uh, at, at the age of 16 to um, live in Brazil as an exchange student. Up to that time, this may be hard to imagine, but uh, I had grown up in the middle of the United States, had never been outside. The United States didn't have a passport, but I had this experience uh, living in another country in a very different culture, time, place. And I came out of that experience convinced that whatever I did in my career, it would have an international focus. So I went to international first, before law. Law really came second. I actually explored very seriously a career in international finance. And in terms of challenges, and this verges into the second part, at that time, which was a while ago, uh, the field of international finance was even more male dominated than the field of law. And so ultimately I decided that you know, someone who had a modicum of brains and worked hard would have fewer barriers to entry in the, in the legal field than in, in uh, the finance field. And so that's the direction I took, but I took it fully intending that I would ultimately focus my career in the international arena. So, so that's, that's the short answer to your question. And, and, and in terms of challenges, of course, uh, I was at a fortunate time following pathbreakers like Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg, whom we're remembering today. Uh, she paved the way for people of my generation. We did not have the, the kinds of overt barriers that she and Justice Sandra Day O'Connor and others of her generation uh, face. So we were the real beneficiaries of that. I had no trouble getting out of law school, getting hired at a major law firm. In fact, I had multiple offers. So I was really fortunate in, in the time and place that I came out. Now, you have to want to do this. You have to be, be resilient and persevere and know what you want to succeed in this career. And that's a much longer discussion, and I won't make you go through all the twists and turns of that. But, but uh, uh, and I'll be interested to hear what Marcia says about it. But, but uh, you know, it's a, particularly if you're in private practice, but also in senior government positions, it is a career that is, is wonderful, but requires a very significant time commitment and, and energy commitment. And, and, and so it's a demanding career and you have to like it. You have to want it. And, and if you do, then I think uh, you, can, you can overcome uh, the obstacles, but, but uh, it, doesn't, it doesn't just get handed to you on a silver platter, Professor Penicino. So why don't I stop there and I'm interested to hear what my colleagues say. 
Thank you, Lucina. The, the, the professor, well, Dr. Low, oh, Miss Low, that's the very, that was a very, very interesting uh, start for our conversation. Uh, I'd like to hear Julia's, uh, Miss Pajari's uh, answer <laughs> to learn more about what prompted you to uh, start this career and again, which challenges you might have encountered. Yeah, sure. So I'm, I'm very excited to be here. Thank you again for, for this event and for inviting me. Um, so I, I would say my, my path and the reasons why I got closer to international law are similar to what uh, uh, Professor Lowe was saying earlier, uh, in the sense that first came the international fascination when I started going to the UK, first at 16 uh, to study English and then at 18 to work there during the summer. And um, I was also very active in local politics when I was in high school. So I got closer to law and legal activities when of course we had to organize our uh, political endeavors. And so the combination of the two made me Basically, I was undecided between studying international relations at university or studying law because in Italy, I mean, some, some of you may be familiar with that system that you can go into law directly after high school. And so I've decided, okay, there's this uh, university, they have an amazing program in international law and great professors. So I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna do that. And I'm really happy I did it, but, um, a couple of obstacles there. One was that, sure, there were international law classes, but out of 40 classes, maybe six were international law related. Um, so I had to find a way to do as much international activities that I could. So participating in Model United Nations and moot courts and finding internships abroad. So that was a little bit the first obstacle in trying to get as much exposure to that field as possible. And I think that <clears throat> the second obstacle is related to this in the sense that um, in Italy at least, the field of international law is not particularly well developed still. In a, in a sense that there is a lot of international, private international law. There's some arbitration um, practice. There are some international law firms that have offices in Milan, but uh, I remember once I, I went for this interview after just, I just graduated law school and I went to this interview at this big law firm in Milan. And so I was talking about my curriculum and well, my international law classes and the interviewer told me, yeah, but what about the real law? What, did you study, you know, commercial law and corporate law and criminal law and civil law? This international law stuff is too easy. So it doesn't count. I'm like, okay, so maybe I, I won't come here then. <laughs> <laughs> um, <clears throat> so I think I'll leave, it, I'll leave it at that for now. Thank you, Julia. And, and thank you for sharing this that's a, if you allow me, it's, it's, it's just an adjective, but it's to give the idea, this peripheral point of view on what international law is outside of the US. It, it, is, it is a complete different cuddle of fish and, and it is very difficult to, to make the big, the big step, the big jump to move ahead. So again, as I think uh, great women paved the way for Miss Lowe and Marsha and great people will pave the way for you. And for me, it has happened a little bit with, with constitutional judges and maybe some Italian uh, law professors and, and, and constitutional lawyers that have uh, finally uh, accessed the top positions. But you know, you should be praised especially because it is very difficult to do what you're doing. So <laughs> congratulations personally, because I know how difficult it is. I'm gonna, I'm gonna move to Marcia and I'm gonna ask her to answer the question. Thank you. Good, thank you very much, Sarah. So I have actually 
some similar experiences to what uh, Lucinda in particular, and also Julia a little bit have, and that is uh, my father was in the US Army. And so I'm what's called a army brat. Uh, so when I was six years old, I lived in Japan. And between the ages of 12 and 16, I lived in Berlin, Germany and traveled down to Italy and all around Europe at that time. <clears throat> so I had a, a very international focus. Uh, we then came back to what we called the States. I see the light may be a little bit funny here. And uh, I went to uh, Catholic girls school when I got, got back. And as I was thinking about uh, where to go to college, I was very impressed with Georgetown and Georgetown's Jesuit background. So I was interested in uh, going to Georgetown. Unfortunately, in those days, and I graduated from high school in 65, in those days, women could not go to Georgetown in the college. Uh, they could be nurses or they could study languages. So the only option for me was the School of Foreign Service at Georgetown. Uh, and I was very happy there. So I um, graduated from the School of Foreign Service in 1969 and asked a old family friend from Berlin, General Philbin. Um, most of the people in Berlin at that time were spies and the only question was whether they were a formal spy or an informal spy. And so he was a formal spy. Uh, and so his background was a PhD in what was then called Soviet studies. And I said, General Philbin, I'm trying to decide whether to go to law school or go into an international relations master's, maybe PhD. And he said, Marsha, I'm really sorry to say this, but the reality is women are not taken very seriously uh, in the world, uh, the business world, uh, unless you have a profession. And so you can be a lawyer, a doctor, or an accountant. And my aunt uh, was a surgeon and I knew I did not have the guts to be a surgeon. So I thought, and I'm, and I'm not sure about numbers. So I thought law sounded pretty good. I enjoyed talking. Um, so I, I went to law school and I've never, never regretted it. I think it was good. I think things have dramatically changed now. Uh, I do think that uh, you don't need a profession to be taken seriously as a woman. Uh, but things were a little bit different, um, I think, maybe for Lucinda, who's younger <clears throat> than I. Um, and prettier, younger and prettier. But in those days, it was harder. Um, it was harder to get most jobs. And, and frankly, we were sort of a rebellious generation. And law firms were not favored by my classmates. That was sort of selling out to the man, as we used to call it. Uh, and so I thought I would go into uh, government where I'd be able to make a change and change the world, which was what I wanted to do. So I went to a US government agency that was then called OPIC, the Overseas Private Investment Corporation. And I just fell in love with the idea the idea of development, international economic development, where you're, you're doing good. Uh, you're spending your career transforming an economy that needs financing. And one of my undergraduate professors who had lived in Indonesia after World War II, one of my economics professors, had talked to me about land, labor, and capital, where he'd seen people sitting around in Indonesia, not doing anything. And he said they lacked capital. 
And I thought, that's what we need. We really need to get capital in places where it isn't. And so I spent five years at OPIC doing finance. And Lucinda is certainly right. Um, there were no role models um, for me for women in finance and certainly not in international finance at the time. Um, but then I've, I've been in big law, big law firms uh, ever since then, doing international finance and, and love it. So those are constraints and, uh, and background. Thank you very much, Marsha. Thank you all for this first round of answers, which uh, were all very interesting. Um, the second question that students, uh, the second issue students are very interested in is the following. Uh, for those interested, and I think it's nicely linked to, the, to your answers, for those interested in pursuing a career in international law, is acquiring a JD or an LLM, depending where, where you are, necessary? And are there other forms of training that you would recommend? I'm gonna start with Lucinda first. Okay, um, uh, thank you. Thank you again, uh, Professor Penigino. Uh, so the, the short answer is yes. <laughs> Yes. Um, now, I'm going to digress at the outset to say that, that we're talking about international law as a concept. I think Julia mentioned private international law versus public international law. But really, when very few people, particularly people in the private sector, uh, are able to pursue careers in public international law. Uh, there are only a couple of areas of, of legal practice uh, that, that focus on public international law. Investment treaty arbitration, uh, which I do some of, is, is, relies on international law. WTO, dispute settlement, relies on international law. Uh, but, but, but if you're a student and you think you're going to argue cases before the International Court of Justice, which is another place where public international law gets practiced, those opportunities are really few and far between. Most of the international legal work uh, that is done, uh, and of course there's government, people in government will also do, do public international law and in international organizations, uh, such as the one where Julia is, is, is working now. So there are some opportunities, but most of the opportunities are going to be in, um, what what is called internationally private international law or transnational law what i do when i do anti-corruption work is much more transnational law uh it's 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 u.s law and the laws of other countries that may apply extraterritorially and affect international business so it's really important to think about these different pieces of 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 uh, uh of of, of, of what I'll call international practice uh, in terms of the career opportunities, because the kinds of work you're going to do is going to vary greatly uh, uh, depending on your setting and depending on, on uh, uh, the elements that I've just identified. If you want to practice in a law firm in the United States, you absolutely need to have a JD. You absolutely are going to need to be a member of the bar. Uh, where you're where you're physically practicing, uh, that's that's going to be just a you know a, 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 an essential element. Uh, you know we have we have many lawyers who aren't originally from the United States, both in our U.S. and non-U.S. offices. Most of them have multiple qualifications, not just a U.S. degree, but if, if a, a law degree from their home country maybe an advanced degree. They're much more qualified than someone like I am. Uh, and that's, that's just the way it is today. So uh, I think also in most, you know, in most legal positions, whether it's in companies or government or international organizations, you're going to have to have those basic, you know, those, those fundamental degrees. You don't necessarily have to have a terminal degree uh, except for teaching, but, but uh, uh, the, the basic law qualification that allows you to practice in the relevant jurisdiction 
and possibly a master's on top of that that gives you some special skills are really the mix uh, that you ought to be looking for. Now, the other part of your question is, do you need, are there other parts of training you need? Uh, I could answer this narrowly or broadly. Uh, when I hire people, for instance, uh, it's not, I, I look for people with international experience as well as the formal training. I look for people who speak languages. I look for people who know how to navigate the world and have ideally lived uh, in, 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 in another culture, because I think that just adds a huge dimension and skill set. Um, so so uh, that's, that's something that's, that's, uh, that, 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 that I look for. But um, other things that are important, if you're doing finance and, and any work that involves money, you have to understand money. You have to be able to read balance sheets. You have to know something about accounting. So depending on your subspecialty, if you're doing a lot of environmental work, uh, you may want to have some scientific training or background. So it just, if you're doing patent and, and intellectual property work, there's technical backgrounds that become very important for people to have, uh, and, and they get very specialized. Uh, we'll hear in, in, in our firm about the need for somebody with an electrical engineering undergraduate degree to do a particular type of patent litigation. So it's, International law is comprised of many, many subfields, and the skill mix for different fields is going to vary. I'll stop there and pass the, pass the microphone. Thank you very much. Julia. So I think I have bad news and good news. So I'll start with the bad news first. Uh, so bad news is that from what I've seen uh, also from my peers that graduated from SAIS, ILAW in my year or in similar years. Uh, not having a law degree is, uh, is going to be an issue um, or an LLM. Uh, in my current experience, for example, um, I, so my role is a little hybrid in the sense that I both work on policy issues and on legal issues but the part the the job that i was hired for really was mostly policy uh, and tax and and then i could go around the office and i met this lawyer and he needed he needed somebody to do work for him and of course i couldn't wait to jump on that because he works on all this integrity super interesting things um, but of course that I couldn't have done uh, without having a legal background and now for future, let's say career progression, not having uh, a bar exam is proving to be difficult for me because all council positions at the World Bank or even in, in other um, in organizations where I could practice international law, they would require me to be barred. So I'm, I'm exploring all the possible opportunities to either do an LLM here part-time while working, study for the bar either in DC or New York, but that's something you'll have to, you'll have to consider if you, if you really wanna go into this field. Um, the good news is that um, there are a lot of uh, my classmates that were interested in international law they did not uh, go for an LLM or for a JD or didn't have a JD before that continued uh, to be on a, let's say in a trajectory that is parallel to international law. So they, they work in human rights or humanitarian affairs uh, with the UN or with UNHCR or with other international organizations or NGOs. So you could continue on a path that would still allow you to have contact with international law. Uh, but it would, as, as um, um, Professor Lowe was saying, is, is something that would be a different field of work. Um, and so the, there are some touch points, but uh, there, there is a distinction. Thank you, Julia. If I may compliment your answer regarding the international human rights field, uh, as 
for experience, I agree with you to the point where my, my former students from, from last year that might be listening right now uh, know that I very much stress the fact that international human rights is not only for lawyers, but international human rights is 70% law, mm -hmm. which means that litigation in international human rights requires some, some law qualification and you need to be barred somewhere, possibly in your own country, so that you can litigate a case. Uh, this is true for the European Court of Human Rights. This is true for the Inter-American Court of Human Rights. And should you be very successful and lucky, this is true for the International Court of Justice. So again, you're completely right. International human rights is kind of a parallel path, but it should be taken, uh, we should take note of the fact that to litigate human rights cases, you need to be somehow a lawyer. I'm gonna pass the, the, the floor to Marcia, Marcia. So I uh, totally agree with what both Lucinda and Julie have said. Um, in order to practice law, uh, in a in a law firm, you you have to be barred. Uh, there are very few jobs in big law firms uh, where you can get away with not being barred. Uh, you might be able to do so in certain areas, like um, in what we call in Washington trade cases. So you may have a 337 anti-dumping countervailing duty background. Uh, you may have a sanctions background. You may have done some time with US Treasury or similar organizations so that you'd be able to do things related to um, embargoes, sanctions, trade issues. You might, might have been with the United States trade representative. So you might graduate with a size degree and go into trade negotiation where having um, a size background, uh, I law background would be very good uh, background where you don't need to, to be barred. But as Julia said, yeah, and Lucinda to get a job in the general counsel's office or in a law firm, 99% um, uh, do require being barred. Um, in, in my area, international finance, I actually run into a lot of people who are doing international finance, uh, not as a lawyer, uh, but doing, doing projects, uh, doing development projects. Uh, they may be with NGOs, they may be with corporations, with businesses, with multinational corporations uh, where they're active in maybe finance, maybe business, uh, who have a uh, I-law type background. And knowing the laws, uh, knowing what they need to ask about, maybe need to ask the lawyer about, makes them a better finance person, business person, helps them to understand where the pitfalls are, where the problems are, gives them that, um, as I say, je ne sais quoi, that something that really makes them better than somebody who doesn't have that, that background. But as Julie said, it'd be really hard to get in the door um, without a, um, a JD to do that. But, um, but to have a general business or international finance job, having a SICE degree would be Great. Thank you, Marsha. Uh, this is so true. This is so true in the different realm of international law that I can possibly think of. And the one that I'm, I know more about, which is that of international human rights, this is absolutely true. Even if you were to sit as a member of a monitoring body or of a UN uh, treaty monitoring body, if you do do not have a strong legal background. You don't know what questions to ask to state officials. You don't know what you look for when you're interviewing uh, those that are supposed to implement the human rights standards. So again, uh, I, I fully agree. I move on to question number three, 
which is uh, connected to, to what we just discussed. Uh, students would love to know which are the hard skills that are needed to work in international law today. And which areas of international law do you anticipate will provide the most employment opportunities in the next three to five years? Ms. Lin. Okay, well, we get, we're back to definitional questions here that, that, that influence how we frame the answer. So I th I th this does overlap to some extent with the prior discussion because, because uh, uh, you know, we, we've talked about the extent to which you need to ha be a lawyer or legally trained to work in the international law field. Of course, within, um, within the law, then there are many sub skill sets that may be important. Marsha's uh, uh, a transactional lawyer, first and foremost, although she, she's multidimensional, but, but uh, she, she knows how to do business transactions. And, and, and I hark back to Julia's earlier comment about being asked why she didn't take commercial law. You need to have a whole base in, in commercial law and specifically in finance law, because she's even more specialized than that. Uh, to do the finance work. So that's a, that's a core skill set that's more transactional. Um, uh, the, some of the things I do are really more dispute oriented and, and regulatory and enforcement oriented, and those require different skill sets as well. Um, it's, it, some of it's more like litigation. Some of it's understanding administrative law and how governments work and, and, and the regulatory processes work. Some of it's understanding how laws are enforced and the enforcement systems. And, and, and uh, of course, if, uh, so, so there are these different sub areas within, uh, within the legal profession. Now, of course, if you're doing work that is international or transnational, public or private, you will often run into international law, hard law, soft law. Uh, as an example, in my, in my area, the, the field of business and human rights is, is, is a growing one. And you need to have awareness of not only the statutes, but, but, but the conventions and, and other soft law instruments that may influence uh, expectations, the OECD's guidelines for multinational business and the kind of remedies, for example. So, so there's an overlay in any of these areas of practice of particular uh, international law sources and methods and way of thinking that, that, that you need to be aware of. So it's already, if you're practicing law in this area, that, that, that kind of mix. Um, uh, as we talked about before, the other, other, other skills may depend very much on, 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 on the area of practice that you're in, but there are core skills uh, plus the international law uh, familiarity for, for uh, any of these areas. In terms of the second part of your question, uh, what areas do you anticipate providing the most employment opportunities in the next five years? An important question uh, that's always on the mind of all, all students. One area that has grown tremendously, and I was thinking about it uh, as, as we were talking about the prior question, uh, because it is an area that actually creates opportunities for non-lawyers as well as lawyers, uh, is the area of compliance. Uh, compliance for international organizations like the World Bank and the group and the IFC, uh, compliance inside of companies because companies these days we have we have criminalized particularly in the United States but also internationally a great deal of business conduct and 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 companies are being incentivized in various ways to um, police themselves to develop internal compliance programs to figure out where their risks are and to devise programs, which are much more than policies and procedures, but that's part of it, uh, to, to try to prevent, detect, and remediate uh, compliance problems before they become big, big, big issues for the company. And a lot of these, some are domestic uh, purely, but a number of them are quite transnational 
uh, in, their, in their application, whether it's bribery and corruption, money laundering, sanctions, business and human rights, and, the, and, and depending on your industry, the list, the list could go on and on. And, and so there has been tremendous growth in, the, in compliance as its own profession. Uh, it started out as a stepchild of legal and usually under the legal department of companies. But, but as it's grown in importance, uh, it's become its own, in many companies, it's become its own uh, function. And partly that's because the skills are different than, than, than many lawyers have. If you're really running a compliance program, uh, the skills can include things like project management skills, training skills, communication skills, auditing skills. So it can call on a number of different skill sets, actually. Uh, still a knowledge of the law is important because that's, that's the, usually the compliance benchmark. Uh, but that's an area I'd flag for attendees that has given rise to many opportunities uh, for people in recent years and I think will continue to grow. Another growing area I would flag is, is uh, data protection and privacy. Uh, we see the regulation of that growing around the world, of course, in the EU. Uh, where you are, uh, at, and, and, and Julia comes from, there's GPBR, um, which is, 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 is a high standard for protection of personal data. We're not quite at that standard in the U.S., but I see in my practice these rules proliferating around the world, and I think what they reflect is, is that, that uh, uh, you know, there is real concern on the part of individuals about what happens to their data in a big data world. Uh, and, and that's not gonna change, even if it gets balkanized, which is happening to some extent, it's not gonna change. And that it has a very interesting interface with the tech sector. So I think that's another area I'd flag that, that we're likely to see growth over the next few years. Thank you, thank you very much. Julia. Yeah, so um, I, completely agree with what Ms. Law uh, just said, because I, I was about to, to talk about the two same uh, fields. Um, so <laughs> I, I'm gonna, I'm gonna focus on the uh, skills, uh, because uh, there's a lot of um, unexpected uh, things that I've noticed since I've started working at the World Bank. So first of all, uh, writing. Uh, I can't stress this enough uh, because um, when I was in law school, um, I don't think I had any written exams uh, or I had to write any legal opinions. The only legal uh, work I've done in a written form was for the moot court when I did an inter a commercial arbitration moot court. But other than that, it was oral exams. So thanks to SAIS and uh, a very intensive writing uh, classes, uh, both before starting classes when we did the intensive English uh, course, which was phenomenal. And uh, for all the classes that I had to write papers for, um, I mean, at the time it was very, very hard and demanding to write and have all these corrections all the time saying this has to you know, this sentence has to go well with the next sentence and it has to be connected and this and that. It's hard to understand how to write well, but it's worth it. So if you can take more classes that require you to write papers, do that. Um, if there's any other writing opportunity you can get, writing for the, you know, size uh, paper or any anything else, do that because it's going to be extremely helpful. And uh, as a subset of that, punctuation uh, <laughs> is always a big problem. So focus on that too, uh, is a skill. And um, another, another thing that I wanted to talk about was um, this kind of lateral skills that I feel are more in demand right now for people who work in, in the legal field. Uh, there's, uh, for example, lawyers, uh, that are more senior to me in the legal department, they are only expected to know how to use Word. Uh, 
in, in the Microsoft Office package and write. Uh, it's increasingly demanded of people to learn how to use Excel and uh, PowerPoints and uh, basic you know, use of uh, formulas and how to make graphs and how to express certain concepts and certain ideas also in a visual form or backed by some data so that's that's going to be very helpful if you can you know build your skills in, in that too and relatedly i i would have not expected to be brought into discussions about it and how to put certain legal requirements into an it form but that happened and uh, I think this is also going to be something that related to the data protection and cybersecurity domain is going to be very helpful if you have some uh, basic knowledge of, um, I don't want to say coding because that might be too much, but of how you can think of legal issues or just legal requirements when we're talking about compliance, how you can translate them into um, a digital form. Thank you, Julia. I could not agree more with both of you. Of course, you push some buttons because you remind me of my, we have this common Italian background in terms of legal education. And I think this is valuable not only for Italians, but for those that have a, a, an educational background that is not maybe American or acquired in a common law context specifically. Writing is not something that we are trained for uh, in law school. And so it is the best investment that you can possibly do if you're not trained in a common law context to really work on your English for the legal practice. It's a complete different cattle fish. It has to be, it is completely different from what you are probably used to from, from your uh, previous uh, level of, of, of instruction and of university. I'm going to ask Marsha to contribute. So the problem with being last <laughs> is that uh, all I can say is ditto, ditto, ditto. Uh, totally agree with what Lucinda said about um, jobs and what Julia said about jobs. I think that compliance for maybe 30 years has been growing and developing and having a I law type background without a law degree is really ideal uh, for, for compliance, understanding the way uh, rules, regulations, and enforcement work uh, is really ideal <clears throat> uh, for compliance. Uh, the whole area of data protection, IT, privacy, cyber is going to not just take off, but it's going to be the foundation of so much of, of what we do. You're not just going to have to be working for Google to really need to know all of that. Um, most jobs are going to require, as Julia said, that you've got the basic IT um, skills. If, if, if you don't know how to put on a Zoom meeting, if you don't know how to do Excel, you don't know how to use the different apps. Um, you cannot cannot function. Um, you've got to know how to, you know, plug in your computer and get your Wi-Fi and know about your hotspots and all the other things in Wagadougou. Um, there's not going to be somebody there to tell you this is this is how how you do it. Um, and I think one thing about international is that often you are on your own. Uh, as, as we travel, as we go places that are outside the comfortable zone, you, you have to be able to function um, and get along in terms of language and you know, outlets and current and all the other things that are essential to, to doing what you need to do in your in your business, one of the, the old questions is always, what about languages? Uh, and I totally agree with Julia. I think that fortunately or unfortunately for somebody who's a native American speaker as opposed to English speaker, 
um, it really is pretty important for people to be able to communicate effectively in, in English, uh, both in writing and, and verbally. Uh, lawyers are supposed to be persuasive. Lawyers are supposed to know how to formulate an argument. But at the core of that is, is knowing the language. So that's, that's very important. But the other question maybe for Americans is what other language do you have to have? And Lucinda and I can talk about this probably for a long time. I recall when she and I were in Cartagena on a, in a big conference, I thought, this is great. I'm traveling around with Lucinda because not only is her Spanish perfect, but if we ever run into a Brazilian, she can pull us out in Portuguese if, uh, if we need to. But what, what is the right language to, to have? Clearly, if you're going to be in international law, you need at least one other language. If you're really going to be effective in business, you need to be able to draft and speak effectively in one other, other language. But even if you're not at that level, if you can just uh, function and understand cultural differences as a result of language, why do people say what they say? It gives you a better sense of what's going on in their mind. It's, it's useful to have language. My, my Japanese is the Japanese of a six-year-old. And yet it's, it's helpful for me to, uh, to have that in the recesses of, of my brain. So people always say, well, you know, the pessimist and the optimist versus Russian and Chinese has been the most useful language. Um, clearly having Chinese um, as, a, as a language for the next 50 years is going to be very important. So ditto to everything that Lucinda and Julia said and you know, my, my two cents about other related things. Sarah, if I could just comment very briefly, um, good writing skills are important regardless of where you come from. Um, and, 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 and it may be more of a task if you didn't grow up in an education system that teaches you those skills. And I agree with Julia, writing's hard. But, but even if you're, you've grown up in an English speaking country, Trust me, you should work on, on making your writing as good as it possibly can be. It's a, it's a task for everyone and one that you continue to work on your whole career. Yes, definitely, definitely. Um, we answered the three questions that were planned for the rounds. So I think I'm going to move on to the questions that have been proposed by, by the floor. Uh, I think I'd like to go back for a second to the JD issue. I think we stressed, all of us stressed very much how important holding a JD is. And maybe we got the audience a little worried because the question is, you spoke a lot about the need to get a JD, but what career advice would you give to a student who is pursuing an MA in international affairs or concentrating in international law? Lucinda. Oh, why don't we mix up the order and get let Marsha start first? So, so let's, I can let's, take, you let's know. throw the ball to Marsha. Marsha, here, here it comes. Well, with my teaching at SICE, I'm very focused on that. So I did try to, to mention some of the, the careers and some of the advantages to an ILAW background. Um, we've, we've already gone through them, but I really do think in addition to the careers, compliance, the areas that um, Lucinda does, uh, anti-corruption, Julia, all the IFC type things, I do think there's something special about understanding the law and how lawyers think. Because yes, common law lawyers may think differently than civil law lawyers, 
but there is something important about understanding that in, in my area, business deal. Now, why is somebody asking for this condition precedent in an agreement? What's, what's really behind it? Is it important or is it something that we can negotiate? So having that kind of knowledge, uh, regardless of where one is going to be in a deal, as Lucinda said, I'm a transactional lawyer, but really understanding the legal component is, it's, it's very important. So I, I think there are careers in law where you need a JD or maybe an LLM and an undergraduate law degree. But the understanding of international law and the breadth of international law I think gives you an opportunity to look at all the different jobs that are available in human rights and NGOs and business and government and compliance and IT and all the other things that we've been talking about. Anyone else would like to comment on that, Lucinda or Julia, as you wish? Yeah, sure. I, I just wanted to add some optimism uh, in the sense that um, the, as I mean, I, I, I bet all of you know this, but it's true that uh, the World Bank is full of sizers. They hide under every corner or in any elevator, you would have a conversation and somebody would look at you and say, are you from size? Uh, and I keep wondering, is it written on my forehead or how, how do they know? But yeah, so don't worry. Um, it's, uh, and it's interesting because a lot of people who were in ILAW or um, were, who studied law before SAIS, they didn't end up in the, in the legal department and the, in the compliance department where I am, uh, but they ended up in other departments of the bank that uh, touch upon legal issues all the time, or even if you know, for example, I'm thinking there's the governance global practice that deals a lot with these things. There's also another uh, department that deals with land administration and so property rights. And uh, there are other uh, cross-cutting departments like the fragility, conflict and violence. Of course, they deal a lot with these things. And keep in mind that the, the World Bank also does a lot of advisory projects for countries in which they advise on the laws and regulations that would be required uh, for certain sectors to flourish. So that's something else that would be very, um, a very good fit for sizers who understand economics and, uh, and law as well. Um, so I think, I think that's, that's my first, uh, um, good news <laughs> and the, the second one is, is as we were saying before there's uh human rights and uh, a lot of ngos a lot of sizers working in this field um it's uh it's not uh, the most how can i say it's not the easiest field to get into of course it takes a while i have uh, colleagues who maybe you know after size they had to do internships uh, which is not of course the best uh, but maybe you you do some internships and then I saw them progressing in their careers and now they work uh, as staff for UNHCR or other UN organizations. At Very first I thought that you were going to say they, it's not as remunerating as one would expect because the field <laughs> of human rights it's beautiful but it's not as remunerating <laughs> as the other fields of international law. I want to be clear on this. <laughs> okay, sorry, that was a... <laughs> uh, that's that's uh, important intervention. Uh, so I would just add a couple of points to, to, to what's been said. Um, if I, 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 first of all, I think just as we said, if you're, an, if you're a lawyer doing international finance, it's important to understand business and finance. The converse is also true. If you're in, if, if you're in business working internationally, law permeates so many areas of activity 
that, and, and I think Julia's examples are, are, are great to illustrate that from, from the context of, of, of the bank. Uh, so, so in a way, it, it equips you much better to navigate the field you're in, even if law is not the major focus. It, 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 it's not just a question of literacy, it's a having a much deeper understanding of a system and how it works and what it's going to produce. And, and, and if you're trying to do advocacy work, where the pressure points would be, then you understand, you understand the system uh, and you understand the kinds of tools that might be brought to bear. So it, it gives you great strategic uh, insights, I think, into how you might approach problem solving in a particular dimension. So I see it as very, uh, as very valuable, even if you're not gonna work in the law. The other point I would make is uh, that, that many people who are coming out of school now may end up having not just one career, but two or three different careers, uh, sequentially in their life or perhaps overlapping. And things take funny turns, not always predictable turns in life. Uh, some of us have pursued what we want to do, you know, from the beginning, and yet there are surprises in that, in that path. And one thing we can say is, is that, that uh, you know, just because of communications, technology, uh, the world is getting closer, and the importance of international uh, 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 law even if it encounters some obstacles uh, from governments uh, 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 from time to time, and we won't go into specifics of who those might be, but but uh, uh, it's it's probably evident to everyone. So uh, it it the world is going to continue to come closer inevitably, and and it equips you to be a citizen. <laughs> an effective participant in, in, in the world economy if you have some knowledge of how, uh, uh, how, how it's put together and how it works. So I, I would say those are my two thoughts to add on to my co-panelists, very interesting comments. Thank you. Um, one specific question that came to the floor, again, regarding the international human rights career. So, I think we addressed the issue of which could be the career opportunities. I don't know if anybody wants to add anything, Car career advice for someone as an individual who would like to pursue the career in this field without having a JD, but with, a, with rather having an MA. I think we covered it, but I don't know if anybody wants to add something. No, okay. Uh, personally, if I may say something uh, <laughs> out of experience, this is an expanding field. I do agree with all of you. Again, it's not, the remuneration is not comparable and it takes a little, it takes a lot of drive, as it was said before, as in all the fields. But when it comes to human rights, it really takes a little of patience, a little more patience than it will take in other fields. So keep up the hard work and don't give up. And, and then life takes turns that are totally unexpected and definitely something happens. NGOs, in my personal opinion, are right now, and private companies in terms of compliance and business and human rights standards are definitely the best, the best place to, to go in terms of international human rights careers, uh, non-legally speaking, not as lawyers, that's what I mean. Another question that, that takes us back to the topic of women in the legal field. The question for you is the following, and I'm going to start with Julia this time, just to shuffle a little bit the order. Reports over the last few years have demonstrated that in countries such as the US, women are beginning to outnumber men in law school. Have you seen this reflected in the number of female practitioners in your fields? Um, no. <laughs> um, but, you know, it's, uh, it's a work in progress. And I think that um, with more women graduating law, this will change. Uh, I think, um, so for example, I know in, in Italy, we still have a big problem, uh, a big problem with uh, women in, um, in general uh, as professionals, but particularly in the legal field, there's very few women who become partners of law firms. There's very few women 
uh, who are in prominent legal positions. Um, I was I was actually reading this article the other day that was talking about uh, women uh, in law firms and basically the conflict that comes with being at the peak of your career and at the peak of your biological uh, reproductive age. And so this clash is usually something that drives women away from um, the legal profession. And in general, they were saying even without, let's say the biological clock issue, um, they see that women are exiting uh, the legal profession in big law firms because of the, um, uh, what's it called? The old boys club kind of culture in which, uh, you know, in, in business opportunities, there's still this um, sense that, you know, there's somebody that you can take out to dinner, go to play golf with. And if you're a woman, you're, you're not usually uh, invited to, to that. I, I didn't experience it firsthand. So I'm just, I'm just talking, I'd like to, to learn more about it from, from the other panelists. But um, my sense is, for example, at the, at the World Bank, uh, we have uh, not, not, not uh, yet in the legal department, um, but I think they, uh, we have a 50-50 gender split uh, throughout the, the World Bank, uh, and they're trying to make it effective for all seniors positions as well. And recently, the general counsel of the bank uh, well, is a woman. She, she's Sandy Okor. She's amazing. And uh, so it's, it's changing. But um, I also think that the, the bank is a little bit of a, a bubble in that sense. Yes, I agree. <laughs> uh, Marcia, do you want what, to, what's your take on this, on this topic? Well, specifically about the World Bank, um, both Sarah and Julian, I know Lucinda knows this. Um, it really has been um, in the forefront. And I recall maybe a decade ago, going to one of the conferences that the bank put on, on whatever they call it, law development and justice. And the general counsel of ICSID, the general counsel of IFC, general counsel of MEGA, and the general counsel of the World Bank were all women. Pretty, pretty incredible. Law firms. Uh, so I'm a product of big law, uh, both at what was then called Wilmer, Cutler and Pickering, and then 20 years as an equity partner at Hogan Lovells. And both of those firms are well known, I think, as trying to break down the barriers and including more women uh, in, in the partnership ranks. But what Julie was talking about is certainly true. And I recall talking to, at one of our partners conferences, talking with some of my German colleagues who were talking in particular about the schedule they had of going to law school, doing their arbiture, doing their, the whole different steps that they had, and then getting into a law firm compared with a biological clock. And they said, it doesn't work. It just doesn't work. Um, in, in the US, I think there are the same problems. Uh, we've obviously got Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg who faced that and managed to deal with it, maybe in particular because of a spectacular husband, Marty Ginsburg. Um, I had a great opportunity to have dinner with him many, many years ago and Marty cooked. Um, so choose your husband wisely. And that's uh, <laughs> an important lesson. Uh, my husband had sort of done it all and he was prepared to be uh, Mr. Mom, be very involved with our, our children, so, so that helped a lot for, for me. Um, but the timing issues are very difficult. Um, in big law, if you're in New York, for example, you're expected as an associate to work 
2,000, 2,200 uh, hours a, a year. Washington, we always had a slightly lower standard. And so we realized that that is, is very, very difficult for active male associates who want to be helpful in the family, but the burden falls much more on on women associates. And so law firms have programs about how to overcome that. And we have mentorship programs and we have women's groups and sensitivity training and, um, you know, uh, bias training and all those kinds of things. Um, but it's still very, very difficult to overcome. And as Julie was sort of suggesting, the bottom line is, do you have clients? And if you play golf or if, if you can go out to dinner with people without somebody's wife getting jealous, um, <laughs> then, then that's, that's helpful. Um, the more, it used to be thought, well, the more women who go into the law, the more women who go into business, there are gonna be more opportunities. That's not as true as I think we would have hoped. Yes, incrementally. We've advanced, um, but are we there yet? No. So, <laughs> Lucinda, your insight. So, so thank you. Uh, uh, a couple of, of, of quick observations. Number one, I think government and international organizations have been great door openers to women. Uh, uh, from what I've seen, uh, the World Bank's been talked about, but the US government and other governments you see you see women entering and rising. And, and we can come back to why that is. Uh, in my law firm, the uh, number of females entering um, the firm after graduation or clerkships is about 50%. We are now just over 20% of female partners. So clearly something happens along the way. And, and my co-panelists have talked about that. It's, it's not just the biological clock, uh, but that is a big problem for sure. But not, you know, people do overcome that, uh, but, but it, there is real tension between the, the hours expectations, the commitment you're expected to make um, and, 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 and uh, the demands of raising a family. So yes, having a supportive husband is really pretty important. And, and, and I have benefited greatly from that. My husband and I have three children plus, plus uh, a son he has from his first marriage. So we've together raised four children and it could not have happened uh, without his deep involvement and, 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 and support. There are other ways to get infrastructure, but you can't do it alone. <laughs> it's impossible to do it alone. And my heart goes out right now in this pandemic period to to the young parents who are struggling without childcare to balance work and 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 family responsibilities. And I just hope we don't see this period as a period of major setback. Uh, for women, but I fear what we're going to see. Um, you know, we, we talked about Justice Ginsburg earlier. One of my favorite stories about her is, is when she was still in teaching before she went on the bench uh, and she'd been working up, up all night writing a brief and, and her younger child was constantly getting into scrapes at school. And the school, of course, as default, would call the mother. Uh, and, and so she got a call one night, one morning when she'd been up all night and, and, and there was some problem and she said, excuse me, but this child has two parents and I want you to alternate who you call, go, call the father. And, and, and it, it just illustrates the need for parents to be equally committed if you're gonna have children to the raising uh, of your children. But of course, it's not just a, 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 an issue with women and children because some women choose not to have children. It's the demands, I think, of the profession and the commitment it requires, particularly in private practice. Now, we have seen dramatic changes, not only in government and international organizations, but also in companies. More and more women are rising to the top legal or compliance positions in, in companies. And so 
It's not a smooth process. It's not as quick as we all thought it would be uh, uh, sometime, sometime back. It's, it's, uh, uh, we plateau, we sometimes go backwards. Um, but but uh, if, yeah, if, you, if you want it, you're gonna have to, to fight these kinds of sometimes structural issues and try to make things like private practice more family friendly, more open. I think learning in this pandemic that we can all telework is a really good thing. Anything that introduces flexibility is a good thing. I, I don't want to telework forever, but I think if we can be more flexible about how we approach doing jobs, that's going to help women. Uh, that's going to help women. If, if we could somehow get away in private practice from the billable hour, that would help women a lot because if you're juggling things, you get very efficient at them. But but uh, 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 so so those are some uh, some some observations and ideas. This this is not an easy problem to solve, and it's a very important one for progress for women in the profession. Sarah, can I jump in uh, just to follow up on the statistics that Lucinda was mentioning? Um, as I've looked at the different studies, it it seems that one of the big problems in law firms. Is, is not the question of mentorship, but the question of somebody who is really promoting you. And when we look at 50% going in, 20%, and then there's always the, are they contract partners or the equity partners issue? There, the statistics show that women leave law firms disproportionately in higher numbers in the year three to five than men do. And the complaint seems to be, well, I wasn't moving forward. I was doing due diligence. I was doing repetitive things. I was doing things that my male colleagues were, were not still doing. The male colleague was, you know, second seat in litigation, whatever. Um, and what seems to make the difference is whether there is a partner who is promoting that associate who is saying, Mary can really do this. She's done a great job on due diligence, but she really understands this area and we need to get her at the next level. And if that happens, then women become more interested in their job. Otherwise you hear all these sort of flimsy excuses the way you hear government officials saying, oh, I left my job to be with my family more often. No, that's not the real reason. Um, women will say, oh, I left a law firm because I wanted to go to a government agency where I could control my hours more. Yeah, that may be part of it, but the statistics, uh, the study, the research shows that that's not it. They were not getting the assignments. They were not getting the advancement they wanted and they were bored and burned out and not moving forward. Thank you, Marsha. Uh, there's a very short follow-up question on, on this topic, and then I think that we are about to end the time at our disposal. The question that came from the floor is, and this is a classic, how do you balance international law and family life? Now, first things first, you choose a good husband or companion for life. That's the first. Then, what else? I think I'm gonna go with with Miss Lowe just to go back to the to the initial order. Thank you, uh, Professor Penicino. So, so yes, we're putting a finer point on the discussion of work-life balance, particularly in the context of international law. So, um, but it does start with the same foundation. Uh, certainly. Uh, what, one of the issues is travel. Uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a big issue with almost, because with almost any international job, there is going to be some travel. Now, uh, I will say for my own uh, career, when my children were younger, I did travel, but, but I tried to really keep it under control as much as possible. We had a rule that we would try to have a family dinner together every night. And, and it got later and later and later as the years went on, but, but we, kept, we kept to it. 
Uh, our youngest complains that we made him eat dinner, you know, Spanish style at practically midnight. But but the point was to try to bring the family together and to keep in touch and to be there as much as possible. So some travel is inevitable, uh, but but if you can have a job that allows you to manage it, and technology is your friend uh, in, in that regard, it gets better and better. It's not a substitute in my view, in many situations for being face-to-face -face, across the table uh, uh, with, with someone, but it can help a lot. And, 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 and so that's a positive, uh, uh, development in recent years. Uh, as my children got older, and particularly after they 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 left home, you know, then I was free to travel as much as as uh, I needed to or wanted to, and 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 I do travel a lot uh, now. But but that's one of the main things I think for international law. The other thing, of course, is is and this this is a factor even if you're not traveling is time zones. You know, the worst days are those that, that start with your clients in, in uh, India or the Middle East and end with your clients in, in, in China, because you can just, you know, you can bookend the whole day. And, 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 and so, so how do you manage those kinds of demands as well uh, and structure your life so that you can, again, give the attention that you want and need to get give to, to um, your personal life versus the demands of the job. So those are a couple of things, particularly of international practice uh, that, that are challenges. On the flip side, it creates opportunities. Uh, my children grew up traveling. Uh, they grew, and, and, and they grew up being comfortable with the world. One of them has become an international lawyer. Um, and and uh, is 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 more of a citizen of the world than 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 certainly than I am in many ways b based on where she's lived and traveled and so 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 I think it's also an opportunity to introduce your children to the wider world and make them see that that there are different ways to do things there are different customs. Uh, my husband was in the government for many years. Uh, in the U.S. in the U.S. government, and he was involved in negotiating parts of the North American Free Trade Agreement uh, for the U.S. government. And and in the midst of ne those negotiations, he came home and he was. We were talking with our children about it, and our younger daughter said she was opposed to NAFTA, which was kind of a shock. She was maybe nine at the time. She was very young, and 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 he said why? And she said, well, I'm worried. I don't want everything to be the same. Uh, and what she was talking about, she had been to Mexico and she wanted to preserve the cultural heritage and the distinctness of Mexico. And it was a stunning comment from a young child, but it just shows the benefit of exposing your children to the world. So it's not all challenge, it's also an opportunity. Great, can we, can we have a first uh, very short answer from Julia and Marsha? And then I see that Akanksha just came back, so I, I guess I have to close the, the panel. Julia, what is your perspective on the problem of balancing international law and, and personal and potential family life? Well, I, I agree with, with everything that uh, Ms. Lord just said. I particularly relate uh, to the early start at 6 a.m. and <laughs> the late start. Can we have a call at 10 p.m.? Sure. So uh, that's, that's fine. But I mean, for me, it's, um, I'm, I'm just, I'm trying to get the best out of everything. And especially of, uh, you know, this, uh, this opportunity that I have. So. I try not to um, to see it as an issue if I don't have much time, but I also try to set boundaries for myself. So um, it's also important, I think, that you try to communicate and find your space, especially in an organization like the bank, which is, of course, more oriented towards more work-life balance, uh, working hours that are more set rather than unpredictable. Uh, so I think that, yeah, setting boundaries for yourself and understanding what is actually extremely urgent and cannot wait until the next day if it's midnight, uh, you have to be able to understand that also and, and communicate it. 
Thank you, Julian. Marsha? The 30 second response, because I do see the hook. Um, <laughs> I agree with everything. Um, I would say also make sure that you spend some time for yourself, um, including with exercise, because <clears throat> if you're going 24 seven, um, sure, you can be as efficient as possible, but things break down if, if you don't give yourself time and exercise. Thank you very much. I think our time is over. I'm going to pass. I think now it's, it's Steven's time to intervene. So I'm going to leave the floor to him. Thank you very much all for being with us. It was great to see you all in this panel. Thank you. You. Thanks. Well, thank you, Sarah. I, I think that was, I think Akanksha, as president of the International Law Society, has done exactly what she set out to do. And I'm, I, I hope that everyone is equally pleased at how well that panel came across. Thanks to all of the participants, Sara, for moderating, uh, Julia, Marsha, Lucinda, for participating in the panel, it was great. Um, we have other uh, activities coming up, which I also want to be sure you are all aware of. In, um, there will be two more um, webinars like this one, same format as this, <clears throat> the next one will be on Friday, October 30th at 11 a.m. Uh, you're, instead of having a, a vibrant conversation of the kind that you just heard, uh, you're going to get me. But the, that's the bad news. But the good news is the topic of that talk, it is the Friday before our election in the United States. The topic will be how to watch election returns. That is, what's going to happen on Tuesday night? not crystal ball sense, but trying to make sense of all of it, aimed primarily at students who perhaps did not grow up in the United States, but I dare say that even those who did may benefit from a, a brush up on how the Electoral College works and what about all these Senate seats and all those things. What, what, can we, what sense can we make out of what, at this perspective at least, seems like something totally uh, nonsensical. We'll have a, another panel um, on November 20th at 1.30 p.m. Uh, and that one will involve alumni as well as current students and faculty. And there, the, there will be even more of the kind of talk that we heard during part of today's panel, um, career focused. Uh, and the theme of that will be, is there life after SICE? Um, I think if that's a yes or no question, I think we know the answer, but, but really the goal is to establish a little bit more content to life after SICE, and in particular, life after SICE bylaw, picking up the questions that I was so pleased to see the panel handling so well about, uh, and it's a question I get asked all the time, why should students come to a non-law school to study international law? And there's no easy answer to that. I suspect there are as many different answers as there are students. Um, and so uh, we'll explore some of that. At the same time, we're, uh, going on during the fall semester. One other item I want to call everyone's attention to uh, is that all students at SICE are invited to participate free of charge uh, in International Law Weekend, an annual event that is sponsored by the American branch of the International Law Association. And this year will take place between October 22nd or Friday, uh, Thursday rather, and October 24th, a Saturday. And during those three days, there will be panel discussions, there'll be lectures, um, from some pretty high powered and pretty impressive uh, international lawyers. And interestingly enough, in keeping with today's theme, the, the Thursday night, there'll be three keynote speeches. The Thursday night keynote speech will be given by Judge Joan Donahue, who is the United States judge on the International Court of Justice. The Friday keynote will be given by Catherine Amirfar, who followed Lucinda Lowe by several iterations as president of the American Society of International Law. She's the current president and a partner in the firm of Deborah Voice and Plimpton. And then on Saturday, the keynote is given by, ju by Judge Julia Sebutinde, who is a, a, a judge on the International Court of Justice from Uganda. Um, you will, in other words, have heard from two of the three female judges on the ICJ as part of International Law Weekend. Anybody who's interested in signing up who doesn't already have uh, the link that you need to click on to get it registered, uh, send me an email and I will be glad to, to send it to you. So that's what I wanted to say, except again, to thank the members of the panel, 
Sara Penichino as our moderator and Akanksha, uh, president of the International Law Society who managed to, to pull this together. First time it's been done uh, in, uh, by, in a student run organization in our department at least. And so Akanksha, you've set the bar very high for yourself, but I'm sure you're going to be clearing it for the rest of the semester. Very glad we had a nice turnout and thanks to everybody for coming. Thank you so much, Professor. I also want to thank all the panelists and Professor Renicino for moderating it. It was a wonderful event and I'm absolutely, I was, it was just, I was, so it was so insightful. And I actually just want to say this last night, my roommate and I actually went over to the Supreme Court to pay our respects to uh, Justice Ginsburg. And I had a very weird feeling not being an American and I felt the loss. And just today's event kind of made me feel like there is hope because based on the news, it's just been an awful couple of weeks. And this just makes me feel as though that for international law and law in the US, there's so much more hope. And that makes me feel wonderful that I'm studying at SAIS amongst such amazing faculty and such an amazing network. I just wanted to say that once. So thank you so much. <laughs> I can't just said it best. <laughs> Thanks to everyone. <laughs>